Entheogenesis australis has created this series of short videos describing a number of species of psilocybe and allied species found in Australia. In this video, I'm going to introduce and discuss the subtropical species Psilocybe cubensis. Hello, my name is Kane Barlow. I'm an Australian mycologist. I have a particular interest in the genus Psilocybe, particularly Australian species. Psilocybe cubensis is the most recognised as the magic mushrooms. It has this particularly distinctive look, uh, as per the photograph here on the right hand side. It's easily cultivated. There are numerous books uh, of particular note, uh, the book by uh, the McKenna brothers and the book by Stephen Pollock. Uh, my first introduction to Psilocybe Comensis was with the 1991 High Times advertisements advertising the PF Tech, a technique that went on to uh, extend the cultivation of this species. Uh, there's, and, and hence there are numerous strains as well. Uh, there's the, the PE strain, there's the Enigma, uh, Golden Teacher, the list goes on. There's many, many, many strains. Uh, of particular note, I recommend everyone go check out the Oakland High Phase Psilocybin Cup. Uh, there's some fascinating results. Pharmacologically speaking, uh, Sujikawa et al. 2003 reported Cubensis as having psilocybin uh, between 0.14% to 0.42% dry weight and psilocybin between 0.37% and 1.3% dry weight. Historically speaking, it was named and described by Franklin Sumner Earl in 1906 as Strophaeria cubensis, a name you might have heard in the recordings of Terence McKenna, as he refers to it in this name quite often. It was described from specimens found in Cuba, hence the name cubensis. Rolf Singer moved the species to Psilocybe in 1949. It's now pretty much a global species. It's been introduced to numerous subtropical and tropical areas via cattle. Aberdeen reported it in Australia in 1958, uh, and it went on to become quite popular in counterculture circles in, in the late 1960s. In terms of cultivation, the book's Psilocybin Magic Mushrooms Grower's Guide by Austin Urich aka Dennis and Terence McKenna, was published in 1976. And then there was the Magic Mushroom Cultivation book by Stephen Pollock in 1977. Uh, these two books really extended the interest and cultivation of, of the species. In terms of habitat, they grow in open grassland. In Australia, they're an introduced species. Uh, quite often found growing from cow pies, uh, either as, as full piles of dung or as, as broken down. They require rain and humid conditions to grow. Uh, they're found in Queensland, northern New South Wales, and they're likely to also occur in Northern Territory and Northern Western Australia, uh, but there seems to be a lack of data on, on this. The season is generally recognised between uh, November to February. Taxonomically speaking, uh, the cap is conic to convex. Uh, it has an umbo. The cap is red brown when young, turning golden to yellow with age. Uh, there is a universal veil which leaves remnants on the cap. Those kind of small white kind of spots that, that you can see. Nothing like Amanita muscaria, um, but if you look closely, you can still see them, particularly on the younger specimens. The gills, the, their attachment is adnate to adnext. Uh, the gills are quite close, as you can see here in this image on the right. Uh, narrow to slightly wider at the centre, uh, and then pallid to grey in colour. Uh, the gills turn dark purple to black in age is a common feature with many psilocybe. The stem, the stem is white to yellowish with age and you can see the persistent annulus on, on many specimens. 
it's the leftover part of the, the partial veil that drops away as, as the cap expands, leaving a little skirt. Uh, that's sometimes uh, purple-black uh, from, from spore deposits. These following photographs show Solus cubensis in their natural habitat. So in this case, growing from quite a large pile of dung, uh, and in this case, a pile of dung that's, that's broken down a little bit. It kind of looks like the mushrooms could almost be growing from, from the soil. This photograph demonstrates some of the features of Solos vicubensis. You can see that kind of red-brown cap that in time becomes kind of yellow, kind of golden in colour. Uh, and you can also see spore deposits on top of the cap, that kind of purple, the purple remains of the, of the spores. You can see the partial veil that's connected to the edge of the cap here in these, these two specimens on the left-hand side. Uh, you can also see the remnants of the annulus as well, a kind of purple black ring around the stem. When foraging for any kind of edible fungus, it's really important to be aware of the potential lookalike species. Uh, some are poisonous and some are deadly. Uh, our advice here at EGA uh, is to know the species that you are foraging for, uh, understand the taxonomy and how the species is described, know its habitat and its substrate, but also to be aware of what poisonous lookalike species may exist. So Lossaby commences does have a few lookalikes. You will recall earlier in the presentation that Solosophy cubensis had originally been called Strafaria cubensis. It does share a few features with Strafaria. The example I use on the slide is Strafaria coronilla. You can see from the photographs that there are a few features here that could be used to describe Solosophy cubensis. We have the yellow to brown cap, the thick stem, uh, the black spores on the stem, and, and the ring. Uh, a common lookalike for Solospecuensis uh, are a number of, of Strafaria species. Uh, other lookalikes are also from Agrosobi. Uh, another species is Candoliomyces uh, candolianus. And then for smaller specimens of Solosomycobensis, species such as Bulbitius, uh, Tichmans, uh, Protostrophoria semiglobata, and Deconica species, uh, particularly for smaller uh, maturing Solosomycobensis, could, could quite easily be confused with these last two. Although with Solosomycobensis there's not the same risk as, say, with uh, Solosomycobensis, uh, which has toxic lookalike species and, and quite poisonous lookalike species, it is important to be aware of other lookalikes that may be growing around Solosobi cubensis. Thank you for joining me today as we've explored a number of Australian Solosobi species.